on behalf of your host, Steve D., this is Bruce Buffer saying thank you for tuning in to Extreme Life. And now, this is the moment Extreme Life fans around the world have been waiting for. It's time! And we're live. This is Steve D. at ExtremeLife.com. Uh, Extreme Life Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. I'm sitting here today with Mark Banani. 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 I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Uh, I wasn't sure. But, uh, you know, I thank you, man, for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome, man. You know, I I love when people, uh, you know, can get in here and talk and share a little bit about their experience, their strength, their hope, and whatever they have going on in their life because uh, really it's about, you know, what makes people change, what makes people, you know, and you, and you work in the same field as I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, a uh, pleasure to have you in. I know everybody's busy and, and, you know, you took some time out today to get here. So, yeah, you so. know, I had to get permission yeah. from the lady. <laughs> we all do, man. <laughs> we all got to get permission from the, from the ladies in our lives, man. Mm-hmm. So she lets me convert our dining room into a podcast it's a, studio. It's a cool so, setup in so, here. I like it a lot. This is so, awesome. <clears throat> um, so that being said, man, um, so thanks again. And, you know, so I guess, you know, the thing I really want to talk about um, is, you know, the whole addiction recovery piece. I mean, it's such a big uh, topic right now, and it's such a big issue. Um, and over the last couple decades, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And, you know, uh, you shared some stuff with me uh, about yourself and this different things. And, and, you know, I just kind of wanted to get into it a little bit, man. So what, uh, what brought you to where you are now? It's uh, it's a crazy story. If we go through the whole story, right, it'll be the entire podcast. <laughs> okay. The, but no, we, we don't even have to. I mean, the, it's it's crazy. Before the opiate epidemic was mm-hmm. the epidemic that it was today, it was making an, its inroads in the 90s when yeah. I was in high school. And, um, you know, I was drinking and doing drugs at the average age of an addict or an alcoholic, 12, 13 years old. I started okay. drinking and smoking pot and doing all this stuff. And uh, I guess... Over time, people started doing harder drugs, and, mm-hmm. and I got into the things that I thought I'd never get into, right? And for a long time, I watched people doing a lot of drugs that I said, no way, no way, no way. But uh-huh. you hang out in the lion's den long enough, you, you know, you eventually, what barbershop. You hang out in the barbershop long enough. <laughs> You're going to get a haircut. Yeah, that's the old saying. Yeah, yeah it's, and so I, I tried the stuff, uh, really everything. I mean, in hindsight, now I can look back doing some work in recovery. <clears throat> I was an alcoholic addict. The minute I picked up, you know, I didn't know any of that picking up the first drink. In fact, it's probably a a decent segue that people still struggle with this thing being a disease. Yeah. Well, the fact is that if I knew what was going to happen to me when I took that first drink, Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have done it. You know, I had no idea what I was letting out of the cage. You know, I didn't know Pandora's box was going to open. And and most people don't. I mean, nobody signs up for that, right? Nobody says, hey... You know what I want to do? I want to use a substance until I become so physically dependent upon it that I can't live without it. Right. That my life is going to be consumed and mm-hmm. ruined by yeah. this stuff. Nobody says that. Yeah. Nobody says that. Nobody why in the right mind would say would, that. Yeah. You know, the only thing I can say is that, you know, because I'm not a first time winner either, is that I, I have told myself the lie that next time it'll be different, mm. you know, after going into a rehab and coming out and saying, well, it was bad then, but now I know better and I'm going to control it this time. Yeah. And, yeah. and But I can't. You know, yeah. I found that I can't. Yeah. Yeah. And so eventually I got so into So you can't control it. I can't control it. I mean, <laughs> you, you figured that out. Yeah, figured that out through a lot of pain and a lot of, you know, a lot of struggle. Yeah, it takes time, man. And the long and short of it is I got into heroin before mm-hmm. everyone was getting into heroin. We're talking 90s. Okay. And um, <clears throat> that's not, not the kind of trendsetter you wanted to be. Not exactly. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it's crazy, too. I grew up in Morris County, New Jersey, in Booton. Okay. And, um, you know... Pretty middle class neighborhood, yeah, decent area, decent yeah, yeah, area, yeah, yeah, yeah. good family. Dad was an ex cop, believe it or not. And yeah. but these kids in the nineties were doing heroin already. And I'm like, you guys are crazy, man! Like I, I, well, heroin? Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? We smoke pot. It's like, like the end of the line with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But it, so it had made inroads back then, and so I picked it up, and um, 
you know, obviously the problem started. And so I went to my first detox and stuff like that. And I was in and out of places, in and out of places mm -hmm. under the impression that the problem isn't, isn't substances for me. The problem is heroin. Yeah. So if I just don't use heroin, I'll be okay. And I would come out of detox and drink immediately. Yeah. And I was hearing what people were saying, but I wasn't listening, I guess. It wasn't okay. hitting home. Anyway, the long it didn't pertain to you, right? It's like, yeah, that's good for you guys, but heroin's but, my problem. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And then, so I got sober though. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. after the fifteenth rehab in, in two thousand, I got okay. sober. Hey, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. That's what right? it took, and it was against yeah. my will. And yeah. you said, what what created the change? And people ask me all the time, like, what was it for you? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah. I honestly, there's not one single defining moment. In fact, I went to the last program that I was in back then. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> And I didn't want to be there. I didn't yeah. want to stay. It got me. Yeah. I was there for long enough to have a little bit of change and see this is a different way. And then I got involved in 12-step and I stayed yeah. sober for a long time. Yeah. But my story is one of relapse. And after yeah. 10, 10 and a half years of in recovery, I left 12-step. And okay. I started trying to live dirty and stay clean. And I wanted to be a gangster. And I wanted to run card games. And I wanted to be a bookie. And I wanted to do all this stuff. And I'm hanging around. So you wanted the lifestyle, but you didn't want to take... You know, the, you didn't want the drugs, obviously, but you wanted the lifestyle, which yeah, I'm guessing didn't work out so well. Um, didn't work out well at all. <laughs> okay. yeah, the lifestyle, I, I, and again, yeah. in hindsight, and now yeah. I know I a certain life. I can't. There's a certain way I have to live to remain in recovery. I believe that. Yeah. Like yeah. it's not just about not using. Yeah. But here I am. I, I hadn't really been to a meeting in a while, and somebody begged me to go to a meeting in, uh, f in my tenure to get the coin. And so okay. I showed up at there and I got the coin and um, I was that guy that shows up and, and, and nobody knew me and whatever the case about uh, certain things stick out. I went yeah. home that night and I went to the doorstep of my pretty nice house in mm -hmm. a pretty nice town with a couple of BMWs in the driveway and my fiance inside and a good job and money. And, and you know, also part of this gangster thing. I thought to myself, wow, like a guy like me, I'm just a junkie. Like, I don't deserve any of this. I'll never use drugs again. Mm. And then six months later, someone pushed a Percocet my way. And I was like, well, eh, this why is not? Right? Probably not going to end well. But so you had that thought, right? Because yeah. that's, that's a lot of times, you know, we fool ourselves and we say, you know, eh, I could do one. Yeah, that's what, what the heck's, you know, I mean, and who's going to know? And that's a big one for me. <laughs> nobody knows. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. Right? Exactly. If, if, if nobody knows it didn't happen. Right. Nobody knows. So. It didn't happen. I'm looking, I'm yeah. looking at this Percocet in my hand and I have a feeling in my gut saying mm. mistake. Yeah. Don't do this. So you, yeah, you got that. But the brain said, it wasn't catching up. Take it, <laughs> take, it wasn't catching up. Yeah. Take it now. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And what happens to a guy like me? Yeah. All I did was set the, the, the beast off. And within yeah. a very short time now, I'm, Planning the days I'm going to take mm -hmm. more Percocet. Don't sell me anymore. Don't I, I don't want any more. Just give me ten more, and that's yeah. it. I'm so you're always, trying to limit it somehow, but it's not working. I'm at work. Yeah. I'm, I'm working in finance, and I'm sitting there during the day planning out how I can, you know, make mm -hmm. this successful this yeah, time. Yeah. And within a very short time, it was out of control. Yeah. And I was doing all the things that I thought I would never do again. Yeah. And so, this went on for a couple months, and lucky for me. Um, you know, God has a plan. I believe that stuff. Yeah. There's <laughs> a plan for all of us. So, plan for all. <laughs> and the plan the for universe me. has a plan. That's how I like to kind of look at it. The universe has a plan for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, it I, may I, not fit with your plan. but Well, and, and here we go, <laughs> right? right? So a couple months in, this is probably July that this started. And by September, um, I'm bad quick. You know, things are bad. But nobody knows because it's been so long and I have so much to lose but i haven't lost any of it yet yeah. because nobody knows that i'm full blown now you know like yeah. percocets i haven't seen one now month i'm i'm into the real stuff heroin and cocaine and doing all this crazy stuff and i'm running these card games and i'm doing that and i'm sitting there and it's a it's a tuesday night in okay. late september mid-september and the swat team comes in Ooh. and so they say everybody freeze now they came to arrest me for this gambling thing what they didn't know is they were going to find a cache of drugs in the car. But I say God has a plan because he sent the people that can rescue a guy like me. And, and that came in the form of the SWAT team and the state police. And, the, and the, <laughs> Not what everybody kind of uses, yeah. the rescue team. But, but in hindsight, right? Yeah, in, yeah. In, in hindsight. Unless you have a hostage. That's Which you're, you were the hostage at that point. Team to be honest with you. saved me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a wreck. I mean, yeah. they got me in questioning and... 
it's a crazy story. I mean, you can't make it up. This is movie type stuff. Well, it's, it's something that I often say, and I try to uh, help families and, and, and people understand. When someone's in active addiction, when you're using, you're not using because you have the will to use. You're using because you're using against your will. Hundred percent. So you're you're basically, in essence, the SWAT team came to rescue you from a hostage situation that you were in. Uh, is it just the way I, I was kind of looking at it there for a second? I've heard it said that you know, speed bumps don't stop me. I need direct hits. You need the wall. I need the wall. <laughs> you need to go the into wall, the wall, man. man. Yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah no, and, I get that. And so I, I would love to tell you that that arrest <clears throat> spurned my turnaround. That wasn't it, huh? It wasn't it. And the cra- the crazy thing, and this is a true story, so uh, I get arrested. Okay. Um, they pile on charges. They search my car. They find a lot of drugs that were for me. I don't sell drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, I never did, but I was using a lot, and I had the money and the means. Sorry, mm-hmm. Hair in my mouth. That's um, right. Sorry, we could edit that out. <laughs> and so, and so I'm in there, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I'm like, guys, what's going to happen to me? Because you know, the other people that were doing this didn't do the drugs that I did. They just ran a card game. Yeah. And they're like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna take, we're gonna, we're just gonna charge your possession. We know you don't sell drugs. So they've been watching me, and I was, you know, under surveillance. They had undercovers there and stuff. But yeah. Okay, fine. So I leave. They, they, I get bailed out. And they took all my drugs, but they left a little in the car that they didn't find. So, <laughs> so you're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, it's so yeah. crazy that this really happened. It was back. We ran this car game in an, in an industrial section of uh, Totowa in New Jersey, North okay. Jersey. And uh, but it, so I had a little bit of drugs left, um, and someone had given me a bunch of Percocets to just get off of E. I was starting to withdraw, and so yeah. they give me this stuff. Right after we got bailed out, and I went back to the car, and I found the drugs, and I I couldn't ingest it because. It's a long story, but I, they took the needles. They took all the stuff. I'm an yeah. IV drug user. Yeah, yeah. They, so so you, had not, like, you had no tools. <laughs> no tools, but I said, yeah. wait a minute. The other, the other day, about a week ago, I threw a bag of tools out the window okay. down the street. Okay. Let me go find that. So yeah, I'm yeah, searching yeah. in this industrial section. I can't find I can't find There it is. And I find the bag, the bag of needles and stuff like that. And I'm yeah. like, okay. I mean, this thing has been run over by tractor trailers. <laughs> Right, <laughs> literally, the needle was bent, and it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just disgusting. But I'm disgusting. I'm yeah, a disgusting yeah. ju- junkie. Whatever's gonna get it in is I'm, at that point. Yeah. You're, you're just desperate, right? And I'm like, so. it works. It works, right? Yeah. And so, I go to the parking lot of some store, and I decide to inject cocaine. And okay. now, of course, the lights come on, so to speak. I'm yeah. out of my mind immediately. Yeah. And I'm like, let me go, you know, Patterson's next door, home is a little bit of a ways away, the jig is up, my family's going to know that I'm using, because they had no idea at this point, let me yeah. go buy some more stuff. Yeah, yeah. so, so now back. you're like, F it, I'm just going all in. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to get some stuff, because I'm going to get yeah. sick, and, yeah. and the, the jig's up, I'm probably going to have to go to rehab, I don't know what I'm going to do, but let me go get some more stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I go to get more stuff, and I've been bailed out for 45 minutes, and I turn around after buying the stuff, and the cops are on me, and I get arrested again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, and I'm like this. And that I might have saved your life, though. I, I, well, I'm on my knees. I'm surrounded by cops, and I had been recovered for a while. And I, I looked up and I said, "I guess you're done. You know, I guess you've had enough, God. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, you're yeah. gonna. This is the second rescue in a day. Yeah, yeah. And I go back to jail. I don't and know if there'd lo- be a third one. <laughs> I don't know. I, and I'd love to tell you. And I went the next day, reluctantly, detox, rehab, the whole thing. And I came out, and a week later, I said, "Just one more time," and the same stuff started happening over again. And I went and I used and I, and I went back on another run and it, this happened two more times. Yeah, yeah. And I had some time and stuff like that. And what it came down to was eventually I had to go for everything that was available to me. I had to go to detox. I had to go to rehab, and I had to go to a halfway house. So and you took advantage of everything that was that was there at that point. I, a guy like I have to be out of options. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't want to do any of it. Yeah. But I did what I was told because I just was done doing what I was doing. And yeah. I kind of burned my life to the ground. I can't even say I lost anything, Steve. I gave it away because that's yeah. what I do, you know. Well, that's what that's what addicts do. I mean, uh, yeah. people who are in active addiction, you know, you know, I used to do this group called the Wishlist Group. Um, and I still do it from time to time when I get the opportunity to do a group with, with clients. But um, I would have everybody write down everything that they hope to gain, everything they want things they want to get back in their life, all these things. I, I, and I call it the wish list, right? So, and they're like, oh, Christmas. I'm like, yeah, let's, sort of. I said, but, you know, put down anything you want to gain out of this process. What do you want, what do you want to get out of your recovery, right? So all these things, they, they write all these things down, they, and then I have them all read them off, and then we talk about it a little bit. What are the similarities? 
because there's a lot of things that are the same. You get a couple people who always put some weird stuff in there, you know, like, uh, you know, which is fine, you know, Off the wall. Uh, trying to be funny, you yeah, know, like, I want to date Pam Anderson. That just gives you an idea how long I've been doing that. Me too. That group. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, stuff like that, you know, you get some of that stuff in there. Or I want to be a millionaire or whatever. But then there's a lot of other stuff like I want my family trust back. I want my, I want to have a car again. I want... Uh, to have a job again. I want this. I want that. There's all these things that are very tangible and very important. And a lot of people take them for granted, basically. You know, I mean, you take it granted. I mean, you know, a well, lot in, of, Yeah, when you're, when you're in recovery. When you you're in recovery or even if you're, you know, what I call an earthling, you know, a normal person without an addiction issue, um, you know, you take a lot of that stuff. You know, you have a lot of things in your life and you take them. A lot of times you just kind of, <laughs> you know, okay, it's just part of our day. Yes, well, and this is what be. we do, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, it's normal, right? Because uh, no one's going to throw you a ticker tape parade for getting sober because you're just doing what normal people do. Yeah, well, I always thought <laughs> that, that too. Point. I did. I, always, I think that too. It's yeah. weird to kind of even celebrate recovery. Like, I wasn't supposed well, you, to. Well, you should because you agree. celebrate it for the person who doesn't realize it's possible. I agree. And that's why we celebrate. But, you know, you get that, you know, so I would do this group and I, and I have them process it. We talk about it, ask them how they felt about here and there. Or, or reading theirs or hearing somebody else read theirs. And then I would sit down in the chair and I'd go, I'll tell you what, I want everybody in this room to think of me as your addiction just for a minute. And they'd all be like looking like they wanted to kill me. So I'd say, all right, you know what? You all look like I'm upsetting you. So, you know, you all look like you want to beat me up. So I'll tell you what, let's forget that right now. Can everybody just give me their sheet? Right? So everybody hands me their paper. And then I ask them, do you realize what just happened? And they, they say, well, what? I said, well, you just handed over your everything you hope to get, everything you want, all your dreams, wishes, and hopes to your addiction. And they're like, well, you said no. And I said, well, you know what? Your addiction doesn't tell you this stuff. Your addiction, when you start using, doesn't tell you that you're going to you know, lose all this stuff. Or not have, yeah, not have, be living under a bridge, using a, a, a needle that you... That you got out of a Fly that you threw out <laughs> three days ago. In fact, it's <laughs> quite the opposite. I mean, yeah. for me, my addiction told me you can do all this stuff and keep all that. Yeah, that's, oh, it does. That's how yeah. I'm operating. Yeah. It's insane. I'm operating under a mindset that I can successfully shoot heroin and achieve all of the goals that yeah. I have in life. Yeah. That's called cognitive distortions. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have these things in our brain that think, you know, a buddy of mine shares this too. It's kind of the same thing you're talking about. He talks about, you know, he, he, he's a recovering alcoholic and he says, you know, every time I relapsed, I had this image in my head of what was going to happen, right? He said, I would go to a, you know, I would be driving by the bar. I'd see all these cars there. And then I get this vision in my head where I'm going to go in, I'm going to have a drink I'm going to talk to a pretty girl. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hang out. It's going to be like the Bud Light commercials. Party. It's going to be like the Bud Light commercials yep. where everybody's just hanging out, partying. <laughs> and he says the reality behind that is he'd go in, have a drink, not talk to anybody, have another drink, not talk to anybody. By the end of the night, he's sitting there like a damn serial killer <laughs> by himself <laughs> in the bar while everybody else is talking to people. He would go home, get another drink go get cocaine somewhere it, and then just went off the rails yeah. right so what he had in the his party head was over yeah what he had in his head that was going to happen was nowhere near what the realistic outcome was actually going to be and he had done this several times and every time he said i had this distortion in my head i had this thought that i can do this and it's going to be a party it's going to be fun because we're always you know one thing i often say to addicted people is you know do you think you're chasing that first one? Because the first one, you, you know, remember, you, you know, it starts off, it's fun. Fun. Well, you, I was going to have a up. whole lot of fun you, in the beginning. You just said it to me the other day. But you can't get that back. Right. <laughs> it's, it's gone. It's fun. Then you said it. It was your thing. I'm going to say. Well, I stole fun. it from Charlie Mills, just to be fair. Amazing. <laughs> fun, fun with trouble, and then it's just trouble. Yeah. And yeah. once it's fun with trouble or later, yeah. it's yeah. never fun again. Yeah. No, it just kind of, it, it, you can't get back yeah. to that first one. You and can't get back to that that time like everybody has that time in their in their addiction best times of my life where you just had a blast best and you know what i had it you had it you know everybody i've talked to uh said you know before it got terrible there were some fun times yeah they you know? say in 12 step i've heard it said before you know you hear people in in meetings or whatever saying that uh their what is it their worst day sober is still better than their best day drinking yeah but no, man, <laughs> that's not true. Well, I, I think they're referring to the end, <laughs> the last, the last, at the end. Last, yeah. But it's, it's kind of, it's not really. Yeah. Fun. I had a lot of good time. High school yeah. was fun, man. We yeah. parties and that kind of stuff. 
And then it got to a place my addiction took me, and I think you're probably were there too. It's no longer about fun. It's about shutting off. It's about getting to a place. It's, you know, yes, the lifestyle has this certain excitement to it, but yeah. it's a twisted idea of fun. It's well, not it's really that, fun. It's, it's, it's a distorted reality. Dangerous. It's delusional. I mean, it's delusional that you're going <clears> to you're gonna be able to do what you did before when so much other stuff has already happened, yeah. right? So you've already gotten in trouble. You've already gotten all this crap going on in your life. And you're still thinking, hey, I could go back to the summer of whatever, whenever, you know, uh, you know, for me, it was like, I think it was, you know, 1990 or whatever. Um, just dating myself a little bit somewhere in there where things were Not still, much older where, 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 where things were still, you know, good. Manageable. <laughs> yeah, they were manageable. Uh, they were more than manageable. We were just doing what people did at our age, having fun. Um, and then it got crazy. You know, a couple, you spin forward a couple <laughs> years, only a couple, it just got crazy and it never, it never went back to that. No matter there's, how much I tried. <laughs> there's something about believing it here yeah. that once the troubles come, it's never going to be anything but trouble, mm. but it's, you might know it here, but yeah. you know, the brain's distorted. Like you said, yeah. the cognitive distortion. We trick ourselves. Yeah. We lie. We tell ourselves lies and we're the only one that believes them. Other people are like, look at him again. Here he goes again. What a nut job. Why can't this guy stop? Well. Our, our brains are set up to <clears throat> block out painful things, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. it's, that's what we do. See, our brains are made that way to put up barriers between things that are going to hurt us uh, over a long term. You know, that's why we have, uh, you know, you know, when you talk about trauma, we have things, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's basically trauma is emotions without words. You know, it's basically you have this overarching feeling inside you. Uh, with, with a traumatic event, like we talk about PTSD, someone experiences, like, uh, you know, the guy who was in combat walking down the street, hears a, a car backfire and, and jumps on the ground or, or just gets that, you know, jump in his, you know, in his, in his body. That's the trauma from being in combat, but it really doesn't have words to it. You know, you can't put words to it. Can't at that point. It's the it. emotional baggage that just kind of sits there without words. Uh, and part of the key to treating that is to put words to it, mm -hmm. you know, is to get somebody to a point where they could put words to it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that's the same thing that happens in, in addiction. Addiction itself is traumatizing, right? So your brain is set up to stop painful things from, from hurting you long term. Yeah, so we block not, it. To so, not allow you yeah. to relive the pain mm -hmm. so that you can repeat it. I always tell people, you know, like probably a lot like giving birth. I mean, there's a lot of joy that comes with yeah. giving birth, but a yeah. woman, I think, wants to have the next kid. Can't remember that. <laughs> if they remembered it, there'd be like five of us on the planet. <laughs> right, yeah. It's, it's, like funny. It's, it's a design. You're like five people it's here. A, right? It's, <laughs> it's a design that, uh, you know, nature, God, whatever you want to call yeah. it. it. It's It was on purpose to But procreate. it's also one of those things that can cause issues with somebody staying sober because the longer you get away from it, the less you remember how bad it really mm. was. And, 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 I you might, and you might say to yourself, hey, you know what? F eh, maybe, you know, maybe I could do one. And then it ends up being a whole bunch mm. of chaos again. For me, I, I just realized this time around, and uh, <clears throat> I need continuing maintenance of recovery lifestyle because I am doomed to repeat. And 10 years didn't keep me from, from the next one. Yeah. And so I stay involved, you know, in the recovery lifestyle. For me, I need it. I need to yeah. help people. I need to go to meetings. And that's, it works for you. Yeah, it, it works, works for you. It's, right? it's what I, I must do. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I'm not saying anybody else needs to do what I do, but I, I know what I need to do. Yeah. You know, I don't, 12 steps not for everybody. And some people can make the right about face and, and, and go on without the bit. And that's fine. Good. Yeah. I'm happy for you, man. If I could do it, I would have done that too, probably. Yeah. But I just can't. And, uh. Well, I've seen people get mm. sober all kinds of different ways. Yeah. As long, you know, the, the one thing we see that's common is is support. That's the one commonality yeah, you know, that we see. Support you, community. You can't do it alone. Yeah, be involved in something yourself. too, yeah. right? Like get get yeah. with some people. If you hang out with the same people and do the same things and think you're not going to do it, I mean, it's um, you are a, who your friends are, man. If you're hanging so out with a bunch of people doing drugs, you're going to be out there doing drugs. I mean, yeah. that that's just the way it is. Especially somebody trying to to get sober from from uh, you know. Uh, from substance use disorders. I mean, you know, you, if you're hanging, still hanging around, you haven't made that change. I mean, that's part of the biggest, one of the biggest issues with coming in. I don't know if you've experienced this when you were getting yourself together, but you know, one of the biggest issues is they want two things at the same time that don't work, right? They want to be sober. They want to be clean. You know, an addict wants to be clean. I mean, no addict wants to keep going. Once they get to that point, they don't want to do yeah, that anymore. They just, they just don't know how to stop. Right. They don't know what <laughs> else to do. 
Um, and they're kind of, like I said, they're using against their will. They're a hostage to their drug addiction at that point. Once they get clean of the substance, then they have some choices. But they, you know, one of the big tripping points is I want to go back and hang out with my old friends. I want to see them. I've known them for 20 years or yeah. 10 years. Yeah, and like you want to go hang out with the same people. At the same bar. At the same place. Right. Like, you're going to go to, well, an alcoholic will often say, I'm going to go to a bar and I'm just going to drink soda. I'm going to say, that's not going to work All out well. All the time, yeah. You know? I mean, and, 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 you know, I wouldn't. And don't. Yeah. I, and, like, they'll, they'll do it once or twice, mm -hmm. maybe. You know, and you might be able to pull it off once or twice. But well, That's one of the worst things that can happen is if you pull it off once or yeah, twice. Exactly. <laughs> if you pull it off once or twice, then you start to get a false sense of security. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. And you start thinking, right. hey, maybe I can do this. And, and you know, like you said earlier, I think when we started was if you hang out in a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. Yep. It's generally what happens. You know, that's what happened to me. That's why I'm bald. <laughs> um, but, you know. You hang out in a lot of barbershops. I hang out in barbershops all the yeah, time. Yeah, I'm starting to hang out in myself <laughs> oh you'll get there my friend you will get there no um but you know it's one of those things where you know you have to uh understand that you know this disease doesn't it doesn't give you a pass you know what i mean you have if you're going to go to a bar and think you're going to drink soda i mean generally if someone said that to me i'd say okay let's talk about that and i would explore that with them i wouldn't just tell them you know don't do that i would have them explore it because me telling them not to do it's actually going to make them go do it Sometimes, you know, it, I, you know, when you look at going into yeah, the don't, take, don't taking tempt the, me, if I take the oppositional approach on somebody, right. they generally are going to do it just because <laughs> I took the oppositional yeah, approach. They want to show you. Well, it's that. And, and you're kind of going against you, you're you're doing a bunch of things when you do that. You're, you're judging. Number one, you're telling them their thinking is no good, which it may or may not be. Probably but, not. But, but nobody likes to hear it. But you don't want to, you know, so they don't want to hear that. But. The other piece of that is if I say, okay, so let's talk about that. What does that look like? You know, how do you do that? You know, and you, and you just keep, you steer right into that. Um, it's called steering into ambivalence, right? You're steering into that, you know, I want to be sober, but I still want to go hang out in a bar. That's an ambivalent thought. That's, I want my cake, I want to eat it too. Mm -hmm. um, and generally it doesn't work out well. So you have a great spot right there to, um, to basically create cognitive dissonance. If you explore it right, if you steer into the ambivalence and say, you know what, let's look at that. How does that go? How does that work? Let's play this out. And you really let them explore it. They're going to hopefully eventually, and, and I've seen this happen many times, get to a point where they start to confront themselves on that yeah, thought. Like, Wait and a you don't have to. Yeah, okay. I like <laughs> which, it. Which sets it up. That's, you know, that, when we talk about motivational interviewing, that's the exact type of therapy I do is it's not tricking somebody. It's just letting them explore it. So that and, and giving them a reflection so that they can keep exploring it so that they might get to a conclusion spot, that a actually makes a sense. conclusion that's actually more uh, more in line with what they're trying to do. Right. Because they're they're You know, they're telling me to want to get sober. OK, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? What do you think it's going to be <laughs> yeah. like I, for me? It's yeah. it's more than just not drinking yeah. and, and doing drugs. It's It's about a lifestyle and it's about living yeah. a certain way and. Through a lot of work and self and self examination and doing some stuff, I, I just there's a lot of things that I did that in hindsight, with or without the stuff, was it's reprehensible. Yeah. You know, well, not, you were you were gambling and doing all that stuff, yeah, right? So not, trying to live a gangster life, uh, even right. though you weren't using. I'm a dishonest, but it's all part of the same. Yeah, it's not, all part of the same thing. I think uh, I like to tell myself I'm a great guy by nature, but I'm not. And like, well, I, I, there's, I, I need some principles in my life to kind of do things and treat people the way they're supposed to be treated. And I, I believe I bought into the, to the recovery 12 step lifestyle. And it's just been a smooth ride since you talking about the goal stuff. And it makes me think about it. Like you see people in early recovery with those goals. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things. One, they're usually selling themselves tr tremendously short because life can be way beyond the car and the girl and, oh, the, yeah. and, and the family and the job. But also what happens I've seen, you know, through my very non-professional 12-step stuff working with guys is a lot of times in early sobriety, they want to get all that stuff back. And the first thing they come out of a rehab somewhere is that they want to go to the gym. They got to get the girl back, the money back and all that stuff. And, it's and like, often they yeah. want it back too fast. Right away. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like, man, just I'm sober now. I should get everything back. Right. And, and, it doesn't and work trust, that way. Right? It doesn't trust. work that way. You, you put yeah. 10 or 15 years into ruining trust. Yeah. You don't get it back in 30 days. And let me tell you, son, you could spend your entire life building trust and you screw up once 
and you got to really get some work done to get it back. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> not, you know, it's like you could tell the truth your entire life. You tell one lie and somebody finds out your credibility is shot. <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna share, I'm gonna put this on and share it on Facebook once once you publish it, and I'm okay. gonna my mom's gonna watch it. And, yeah, and then, and she's gonna comment now, probably because I'm saying it, but also because she would anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's been so be careful so, what you say. No, no, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll have yeah. eight years in in, in uh, back clean and sober yeah, in awesome, December, man. and that's, I had ten. Hey, let me shake your hand. Thanks, bro. That. That Thank is, you. That is awesome. So. But the, but the thing is. That hasn't happened really this time around, but year seven, eight, nine, last time, yeah. every once in a while, and we're talking about trust. Yeah, yeah. She'd look at me and be like, she'd give me the look. Yeah. And I'd look at her, I'd say, why are you looking at me like that? Are you yeah. crazy? Like, yeah. you know. And But she's thinking, you know, I've damaged the trust and the relationship to yeah. the point of, she's looking at me like, did you, did you get high? She's yeah. thinking I'm high. And I'm like, you're crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, so sometimes it never But she may have every back. right to think that, right? She so does. it's 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 she one does. of those things that, you know, but if guys you, like if us you, aren't supposed to be clean and sober. If you if you get to a point where you've burned somebody a number of times and lied to them and was dishonest with them about your recovery, you know, I, I mean, I see it all the time. I mean, you know, addicts come into treatment, they they, they they work on themselves, and then they have one family session, they expect everybody to trust them again as soon as they get Crazy. home. And it's not realistic and they're and like, And they can't understand why, and we have to explore that. And I, and I get, that's all part of the disease, man. It's all part of it. It's mm -hmm. not knocking them, it's not saying anything, it's not knocking the family. The family is where they are. You know, the one thing we have to realize is, you know, the and I've heard this from families too, it's their problem, why do I have to deal with it? Um, because it's a family disease. It's one of those diseases that everybody's in, involved gets affected by what's going on, right? So um, sometimes the family gets sicker than the person I'm treating. I, a lot of times. Isn't it crazy? Uh, and they don't even know it. it. They, they, and, and they don't even have a drink or a drug to no. kind of numb the pain that we, they're dealing with. We've seen family members need medical attention because they're going through stuff related to the it. person's addiction. I believe it. Um, I give you one example. I had, a, I had a, this is going back several years, but I had a, um, had a client. She was a diabetic female in her thirties. Um, you know, alcoholic, which is a terrible combination for a diabetic. Mm. Um, lived with her mom. Her mom was like, I don't know, 70, somewhere around there. Um, she ended up, uh, Going into, you know, she was drinking one night pretty heavy, ended up being unresponsive. Mom called the paramedics. The paramedics came to the house. Um, they revived her. They got her up. She became combative and started fighting with the paramedics, didn't want to go to the hospital, wouldn't cooperate with them at all. Mom had a heart attack right there in that oh room. Oh, my God. Um, and <clears throat> had to go to, and ended up leaving with the paramedics. And the daughter stayed, well, stayed. They left the daughter where she was, but took mom with a heart attack to the hospital. Now, mom, thank God, survived and was okay. Um, but that just goes to show you. I mean, I've seen people with gastrointestinal issues because of, you know, their, their loved one's addiction, just because of the worry, the stress, the fear. You know, every parent could tell you about that phone call that happens at 2 o'clock in the morning that they, re that they dread getting yeah, about I've their loved one. Yeah, I've heard it hundreds of yeah, times. Yeah. You know, yeah. just waiting on the call, just waiting on the call. Yeah. Or sometimes they're, you know, in the epidemic we're in now, they're sitting around the house and they're, they can't sleep because they're, the person's there and they're using and they're running around with Narcan kits and stuff and Narcan and their kids. And it's just, oh yeah, oh it's, man, it's, that stuff breaks my heart as and, much. And or what more even than breaks my else. heart even more than that is the family who's kind of accepted the fact they're going to lose their child. Yeah. There's another it's, side to that too. They get to mm. a point where that, that phone call hasn't come. <laughs> For, for a long period of time. But they know it's going to. But they, they've already anticipated it's going to happen, and they've already gotten to that point where they've accepted the loss. Um, you know, one story comes to mind of a, of a young addict who was living in their parents' basement, and uh, the mother, you know, had already kind of gotten to that point where she's like, this is never going to stop. Uh, one day, he, she didn't see him for like three days, and she figured, oh, he must be dead down there. He must be, you know, and, and, and she, won't even go down. And she like literally accepted it uh, as okay. Well, at least it's over. And then he came walking upstairs. But <laughs> that's, I mean, it's really but but can you imagine the guilt that goes along with that feeling and that thought? You know, because it's like you know it, they go to this point where it's it's just you know it's it's such a hard disease to deal with because there's so many things that are encompassing in it. Uh, the behaviors, the the stealing, the lying, the you know, and and the stigma, 
you know, there's a huge stigma. I mean, we, we I, I can't tell you. I look at social media sometimes, and there's things people are saying to people on there that are just outrageous, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't comment because I'm not getting stuck in that whole right. thing. But it's just a, it's a lack of understanding yeah. of what this stuff is, going back to what I was saying earlier. You know, that person did not, when they first drank alcohol, which is pretty much the on-ramp for yeah. almost everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, typically that or yeah. marijuana. I like to look <laughs> at cigarettes. Or okay, maybe I go right. Cigarette. I go all the way down the line, right to cigarette. Like when you first smoked your first cigarette, think about that because you're breaking that barrier. That, yeah, that, probably eleven. Everybody probably told you not old. to, but yeah, you did it anyway. Yeah, it's an adult <laughs> thing to do. Yeah, you're probably right. I wonder if there's any research kind of connecting that. I guarantee there's someone some. who smokes cigarettes some. that yeah. young, they probably fall into it. Actually, that's Just why they asked that question: mm-hmm. How old were you when you had your first cigarette? Because there's a likelihood of addiction. Uh, mm-hmm. The younger you start, but smoking, the people that so. make those comments think that there's a choice involved here. That it, there's yeah. a disease, a choice, and, and I, I just, if you use rad, uh, logical thinking, yeah. you know, lo- logically, no one would would take the first drink if they knew yeah. that this was all going to yeah. happen. They're not. It's just not something we know. And if the person never had a drink or never smoked that cigarette or never smoked weed, they'd never suffer from the addiction at all. Yeah. Right, it, yeah. it only shows itself when you ingest the substance. Or <clears throat> they might have it might have taken another form. You know, I look at things All like that. you know uh, we have a lot of different types of addiction out there. We have process addictions like gambling, shopping, sex, food, all those other addictions that are out there that are that you don't really have to ingest a substance to to get there. Um, you know, you basically just have to something activates that part of your brain, you know, uh, and, and, you know, one thing we see in addiction too, is usually there's more than one addiction going on. Yeah. It's not just one thing, whether it's two substances or a substance. And, you know, I see a high likely, uh, a high prevalence of people who come in for stimulants with a gambling addiction, uh-huh, okay. cocaine and gambling seem to go very hand in hand. Yeah. Cause you gotta remember the gambler is all about action and rush <laughs> all course. about the action. And there's a lot I, <laughs> yeah. I've experienced it. You yeah. Know what I mean? Well, I you would know with the, with, with the love, history you know, that you, yeah. you know, with the, with the running the gambling thing. Yeah. And, and I've and come out of a poker game at six in the morning and felt just like I smoked crack all night. Yeah. And I've been like, wow, I don't, I feel ragged. It just is not a yeah. good feeling. Yeah. And it's like mm-hmm. I said, there's all kinds of addictions and, and would somebody, who has that addictive propensity actually uh, or predisposition uh, gravitate towards some other type of addiction if Often. they hadn't found that one. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it's different for everybody, but, you know, there, there's probably some likelihood there mm-hmm. that that would have happened. Uh, I, most likely. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would think so. So it's like, what do we do, I guess, with all this stuff? At, at the end of the day, we try to help as many people. It's just, isn't it hard? I mean, in the, in the early stages, when you're working with people that are very early in a detox or rehab, it's like yeah. that, that cognitive dissonance is still very present. For m- me, I didn't even really truly think about wanting to be sober f- mm. for the rest of my life until about 90 days separated from the substance. I was really on the fence pretty much the the entire and this is both it's not uh, uncommon. It's this is this is the first time I got sober and this was the second time. Yeah. You know, it took me a while. I needed to be uh what's the word? I needed supervision. Well, I needed you, you supervision needed something in place while. to really kind of guard that yeah, for I had you. An answer yeah. to it. You know, yeah. I went to a halfway house in Jersey City this time. Yeah. And um I was coming from I mean it was like a bump, a step up from a homeless shelter. Yeah. And I have a house. I own a house. I had cars. I mean, I had a job. And yeah. I'm on the top bunk of this thing, and I'm saying to myself, how did I get here? Yeah. But then I would watch, and people would come home, and you're living with 15 or 20 other addicts and alcoholics, yeah. and they're walking in, they're high. And yeah. they're, the minute they walk in the door, it's drug test, you're out. And they're on the street. Yeah. And that in itself was enough for me. I just knew because a big yeah. thing, I, I can't pull this. So I can't get away with it. Yeah. So the desire was. Well, you needed that accountability. You needed accountability. that accountability. And a lot of people do. A yeah. lot of people need that. You know, I was also that type, that person, man. I mean, I, I've been, uh, you know, sober since 2002. Congratulations. Um, for thank you. Yes, thank you. Long time. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's, but I, that was through no, uh, the initial recovery piece was through no action of my own <laughs> um, always that was, my. that was the action of you know like you said um, 
you know, I needed to hit that wall. I needed it, something to happen. And, and, you know, the police told me, hey, you need to stop. Yeah. <laughs> and then the judge told me, hey, you time. need to stop. A lot of times, <laughs> so, right? so that was, that was kind judges of. Judges are good motivators. Judge, judges, hey, you know what? Um, as much as it was a, it was a. Sucked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it, it did like, suck. As much as it sucked, um, they saved my life at yeah, that man. point because right? I wouldn't be around right now. I'm, I'm a firm believer. There were people and, and you know, um, there were people at that time, friends of mine at that time who were taking bets on how long I was going to live, you know, because I was probably 140 pounds soaking wet. I was doing dope 24 hours a day. That was my whole job at that mm-hmm, point mm-hmm. Um, was going back and forth between Newark and, and home. Uh, until I lost my home and then Newark and people's couches yeah. until they got tired of me and then it was Newark and a bridge and, you know, whatever. But <clears throat> finally, you know, like I said, you know, that bottom, I always tell people, I didn't hit bottom. The bottom hit the hell out of me. Right. Me too, <laughs> the man. bottom right. slapped me really hard um, and said, you need to stop. And if you don't, this is your life. And you need to spend all your life in jail if you're not going to, uh, stop, you know, that that's generally where things had to go, you know, um, at least initially, you know, we talk about external motivation, right? External motivation is all that stuff outside of you. Yeah, that I had you in. none internal. I had zero no, I didn't internal either. motivation. I didn't either. I, I thought that was just it. You yeah. know, um, we call it fatalistic denial. This is me and this is how it's going to go. And I'm just going to die this way. Um, and, you know, and I kind of accepted that yeah. at that point. Um, unfortunately with me, you know, I mean, if I would have kept going, either either someone was going to kill me or because I was ripping people off and doing all kinds of stuff. But uh, or I was going to get, you know, or I was going to off myself somehow with, you know, an overdose or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, you know, so thank God. The, the universe conspired to get you sober. <laughs> the universe conspired against my my own willpower yeah, at that point. Me too, man. And, and decided you need to you need to do something different, and put me somewhere long enough to where I would say, okay, this is not what I want. What mm-hmm. do I do now? Yeah, and I, I had and long enough taste to say, wow, this is actually yeah. easier. Yeah, it's easier to be sober. Like life. That's is, what has to happen. Yeah, and it can get pretty good. And that's and then I, then I pursued. Okay, now I'm stopped. It's been a few months. Yeah. What do I need to do to stay stopped? Because I also knew myself, the very, especially the first time around, I had about six months uh, in this particular place that I was at, and I was going to move into my own apartment by myself with my girlfriend at the time, and I'm like, this thought came to me, and it wasn't my thought. It was like, you're going to go do it, but you haven't done much in the yeah. way of recovery. Like, uh, the minute you can get away with it, you're going to. Yeah. You better do something more. So if you have that thought, you know, you know, I always tell people, you know yourself better than I know you. You've been with scared. you longer. So. I was scared, yeah. man. And I, then I then I started pursuing some of the 12-step stuff. And yeah. the thought never came back until I left, you know, yeah. essentially. Like, but yeah. don't, I don't want anybody to think anything other than, you know, for me, like the 12-step stuff works. I left. I stopped doing it at yeah. around year well, eight and lived dirty and stayed. That's, that's what you, and, you know, see, though. I thought I was good to go. That's what you <clears> see, though. I mean, I'll tell you, when I, when I ever get, whenever I get somebody who's had a significant period of time sober come through the doors of, of the facilities that I work at, um, I always ask, what happened? You know, I mean, tell me a little bit about what, you know, help me understand, because I, I always meet everybody with an intellectual curiosity of their perspective of what happened, what led them to where they're at, and, and what, they can, what they see the solution as, right? Because that's important. I can't, I can't solution a problem for you. <laughs> you have to give me some idea of what you see as a solution, and then I'll kind of, with your permission, give you some some insight into what I see that solution looking like or making some alterations to that solution. But, you know, I always ask, what what happened? You know, you get somebody who comes in after 20 years of sobriety and, and, and has day one now um, after, us- stuff, after using for three or four months, right? Um, that's a hard piece. I mean, there's a whole, whole bunch of things that go into problems there, like ego. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ego's I huge. know what I need to do. Yeah, right? I know what I need to do. I've done this before. 
you know, you get all kinds of things that happen there. Uh, you know, like I said, ego's the number one. You can't get you can't get sober with with an ego problem. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. you got you got to get that out of the way. Uh, I always tell people, ego is not your amigo. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to get a sign that says that. One of my favorite. I, I you know, I would have that. I would have an ego box somewhere where everybody checks in there. What's one thing you're egotistical about? And put it in a box and just leave it there for today. Um, but. You know, they come in with that, but they, they always tell me, you know, well, I got away from, you know, either the 12-step programs or wherever their support system was. Some reason they decided that they didn't need it anymore, mm-hmm. and they started to walk away from it and turn their back on it. And, you know, the thing is, you could st- I've seen people stay sober for periods of time without, you know, after they stop going to AA or stop their support. Me, I did it. Yeah. A couple years. Yeah. And, and it can happen that way, but. You know, the point of that is not that you need it all the time. It's, you know, a friend of mine says, I go to two types of meetings. Ones I need, ones I don't. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to need. Because you don't know. How the hell do you know what you need? People, I, people yeah. say, I, I go to f- five meetings a week. I probably could get away with going to one, but I don't know which one it's going to be. Which one? To be. Or yeah. which one is going to be the connection that you need, right? Because yeah. that, that's really what it's about. It's the connectiveness. It's not that you don't need it. You, you may be able to stay sober for 10 years without it. You might. Mm-hmm. But... Is it worth the gamble? Is it? Yeah. Well, what if you're wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Number one, that's a big question I ask a lot. You know, you may be right, but what if you're wrong? What happens in that in that sen- uh, in that circumstance? Um, but you know, you got to look at it like this: if you have that connectedness, like let's say you're you're going to meetings, you're talking to people, you're you know, and this is just going down a 12, 12 step rabbit hole, but. You're going to meetings, you're talking to people, you're working the program, you got a sponsor, you got a group of people you hang out with, you go to the movies with, you do all kinds of things, but you go to the diner because we, we love to do that. Diners. <laughs> Diners are like the big thing. Um, and um, so you're doing, you're doing, you know, you've got this whole group of people that you're connected to. You decide, I don't really need it anymore. So slowly what happens is you start to lose connectivity with those people. Uh-huh, over you're a al- suddenly alone. And then you have nobody, right? Mm-hmm. Then life happens. And then ego kicks in. I'm not going to call these people. Well, right? why, why? Even if this wheels start to come off. Yeah. You're well, so far away. It's like, I'm not going to talk to them. Well, because you've already kind of said, I don't need it. Cut. Right? You so cut. You, you cut it off. You said, I don't need it. Um, you've walked away from it. And now it's hard to call because it used to be easy. It used to be like, you just make a call. Hey, he talked to you 10 minutes ago or yesterday or whatever. This is what's going on. You won't believe what just happened. Mm-hmm. Holy crap. My tire blew on my car. My windshield wipers won't work. My, <laughs> you know, 50 things just happened in 10 minutes, right? Because that's how life works sometimes. Sometimes the universe just says, you know what? <laughs> I'm yeah. going to take the wheels off everything yeah. for you. Um, and, you know, when you already have that connection, you can make that call pretty easy. But when you haven't called somebody in a year, <laughs> tough to make the call. I was talking about to somebody about it on Friday. It's crazy because people sometimes, even in, in you know, in the twelve step fellows, they're dying there because of ego. Mm-hmm. With time sober, time clean, whatever, whatever they're at, wherever they're at, and maybe something's happening. They're having the idea that they're starting to have thoughts yeah, of yeah, using, yeah. but they don't tell anybody because yeah. I got seven or eight years, and I, I, you know, I'm not supposed to be in this position, and they're, they're dying in there and not yeah. talking about it. That happens. It's like, yeah. you know, we forget sometimes that it, we're, this is what we're supposed to think sometimes, yeah. you know, like just with, because you have time away doesn't mean that you're immune to ever thinking about it ever again. I have so much respect <clears throat> for the person who could walk into a meeting with 35 years sober and said, I felt like drinking today. Yeah, uh, me that, too, that's, man. that's, you know what? It's honest. I didn't drink, but I felt like having a drink. And they got to a place. And that's okay. They don't, you know? right. It's very okay. And they're finally yeah. at that place where they don't care. It's not about saving face anymore. Nope. So I'm, I'm, and we forget, man, it's about saving our asses. Yeah. The idea is stays clean and sober. Well, that's it. And, and I'll tell you, one of the most, uh, one of the moments that have, you know, I was, you know, early on in my recovery and, and I got, I went to this meeting and there was, it was a celebration meeting, and there was a lot of time in this room. I mean, it was ton, It was an AA meeting, and it was a ton of time uh, in this room. And this one gentleman got up, and he had 50 years sober. Crazy. 50 years. And for me, I had like two or three or whatever the hell I had at that Which time. I don't even know. still a big deal. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but I'm like, okay, well, you know, this guy, you know, he's, uh, he goes up there and and his sponsor actually had less time than him because, you know, I mean, at that point. It's pretty tough to find a little more. <laughs> How the hell are you going to find, find <laughs> 60 years, you know? you got to live mean, a long time. This guy had, you know, he was probably 70, 
80-something years old, 80 years old maybe, you know, and, and he had 50 years of sobriety under his, but that's Bill Wilson kind of time. And, you know, he, he, you know, he got up to the podium, and, you know, everybody's clapping and carrying on and, and going crazy. I mean, because this, this was a huge meeting. There was like 100 people in there. That's a big deal, too. 50. I mean. Oh, yeah. He was the last person to go up there. And everybody was kind of, was kind of like the main event of the evening, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so he, <laughs> he kind of he goes up there and he gets up there and he, with a really rough voice. He only said like a couple words as he got his coin for 50 years. And I think it was like a solid gold coin that everybody chipped in and got him. Um, but... Uh, he got up there and he said, what the hell's everybody clapping about? We all have today. Yeah. And that was it. And, and the whole place got quiet. And then he just walked off. Right. That was it. Um, and, and it's for me, that was like, wow, this guy has 50 years of sobriety. Walked up there and literally just said that the person, the mo- more important person in this room is the person like me or the person who's less than only you. been there for a day. First meeting. First meeting, you know, he's like, he just like, it's 50 years, so what? You know, and, and I'll tell you what, I don't, I know people walking around in the rooms today with like a couple of years, like they're Mr. Recovery mm-hmm. <laughs> or Mrs. She- Recovery, which, you know, that needs to kind of, you got to dial that back. It's, it's, it's all about sharing so that other people you know you give you keep what you have by giving it away right if you're involved in the rooms you have to give it to other people in order to keep it that's why i love this particular lifestyle because they designed something perfect to keep a a person like me who's i'm definitely not add but i get bored quick Hmm. and in the end of the day the 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 deciding factor is or not the deciding but they keep you engaged you know the the 12 step says that we have to help the new guy achieve sobriety that's really what it's about like i don't go to meetings to hear i think i personally believe it's a problem if i'm still going to meetings for to hear something that's gonna keep me f- sober for that day yeah. there's something wrong with my recovery yeah i'm really there to try to find the next guy to help that's what i need to do self-sacrifice through work and that's, that in essence helps you stay stay clean it's you the know? biggest that, payoff of all and that, you know? that's you know and it's great to hear you say that because you know the the thing is that i, I always try to encourage people on is because i've had people say to me you know, Steve, I want to come work in the field of addiction because I think that'll keep me sober. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so no, I tell sir. them that no is man. a really bad idea mm-hmm. if you think it's going to keep you sober. Because, I, you know, this field is stressful. Thing. This field has a lot of stuff in it um, that can, you know, take you out. Yes. Um, you know, so if your house isn't clean, if you're not working your own stuff, whatever that is, I don't care if it's through your church. I, I talked to Charlie Mills uh, last week about... Yeah, um, you know, recovery and all that stuff. And, you know, and one of the things I said was that, you know, I don't care how you do it. If it works for you, it's working. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's not. If you got some years sober, you got time sober and it's worked for you. And you're happy. And whatever you're it is, it. I don't care what that is. I don't care. As long, you know, like I said, as long as it's working for you, um, you know, because you hear the terms clean and crazy, dry drunk, all that stuff. Well, you could be that. But you could not be that, too, and, mm-hmm. and be doing other things. Just because you're not going to 12-step meetings doesn't mean you're not doing something right. <laughs> just yeah. means something else is working for you, Yeah, whatever that is. And that may not work for everybody else. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's about trying to keep yourself, you know, it's about progress, about keeping yourself well, making progress, moving forward, not taking steps backward, right? And if you step backward a little bit, you got to kind of, push through that mm-hmm. right and move 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 ahead yeah we're all going to come across but, uh, controversies yeah. and, and, and life's gonna like life's, you said, life's gonna smack you it's gonna throw you all <laughs> kinds of stuff we gotta walk times. through yeah. it and yeah and i was thinking about it before because this is a funny story this actually happened too and i know you're the gym gym guy and, and crossfit yeah, and uh, me too stuff. i mean i love working out and all that stuff so you know in one of these runs right uh in my relapse, because I had been going to the gym for years, and I, I did a lot of stuff, and I, you know, I did steroids, and I was, you know, like a Jersey Guido, yeah, Jersey yeah. Shore, you yeah, know, yeah, was, yeah. but I'd picked up, and I was going to this guy to buy stuff or whatever, and he just couldn't keep up. It got crazy quick, and this yeah. guy was like not a real, very good 
drug dealer. So okay. he, I'd call me like, I don't have anything. I'm like, what he didn't you go do? to the drug dealer college. I'm or? like, dude, you, you don't have, you sell heroin, but you don't have any. You realize I need this stuff all the time, right? I'm like, all right, whatever. So I go back to the street and I just tell you the story because you'll appreciate it. So I, I'm like, I'm, I'm roaming around. I do not, I'm an early relapse in this yeah, point. Yeah. I'm driving around. I have a, a white BMW truck. That's not normal in the hood. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm, they got a close cut hair. I mean, I look like a cop and I pull up on the block and they're like, no, dude. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. I said, no, no, you don't understand yeah, yeah. here look at the stuff here's my gear in, in in the center console and he's like oh okay go in that building so i go in that building and i'm nervous i hadn't been to the street streets in a while yeah. like 10 years yeah. and now I'm you got a, someone telling you go into some building some building <laughs> just go in there, rolled in there i have no idea what i walk in and it's like it's i was like this is i didn't like it that yeah. was uncomfortable for the for, it was just people doing doing drugs selling drugs it's everyone strung out and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. i'm on my way but the reason, because the kid says something to me, and I said, "What?" And it was just like a like a like a, a homeless guy living there to use kind yeah, of a guy. Yeah, yeah. I said, what? What did you say? Like, not he wasn't, wasn't aggressive towards me. He's like, "How much can you bench press, man?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, I mean, at that time I looked like a like a yeah. bodybuilder size yeah. guy, and I was like, well, I mean, three eighty five, and I'll never forget it. Like, I think I maxed out at three eighty five that day. But I told him, I said, if I keep coming here." It ain't going to be that way for a long time. <laughs> no. It's just a weird thing. Yeah, that, yeah, that 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 strange. I never forget it. Man. <laughs> it's a weird question to come from a drug den, man. <laughs> yeah, like he was just a guy. Uh, we were like online to buy heroin type of a thing. And yeah, he's yeah. asking me that. And I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. just, no, this it's... is not going to go. Ominous warning, they say, you know, my the literature of where I go. It's yeah. a, it was an ominous warning that I could fail to heed. Yeah, yeah. And you know, kept I was there, going from yeah, there for a little there, bit. And I just knew. I was like, man, this is bad. Yeah. This yeah, is well, just bad. You know, it's we all have mm. our process, man. We all, and then that's the thing. And thank God you're sober today, yeah. and you're clean today, and you have a great story Lucky. to tell people today, and you're helping people today. I mean, I know I've known you for a while now, um, and I know you get, you, you know, you you're passionate about what you do. You want people to get sober. You want to help people get sober. So it's really cool, um, you know, that that you're doing what you're doing, and you're and you're here to do it. Yeah, you too, man. I mean, uh, it's it's it's, it's fun. It's it's fun. It's heartbreaking. It's. Yeah. It's well, what I was taught to do from the very beginning in the recovery in the 12 step lifestyle. It's just that I, now I do it in addition to that, I yeah. do it as a job, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's like I said, I think that, that's a really big point though. You're still working on yourself outside of your job. It's not like you're, it's a must. yeah, it's not like you kind of just say, okay, I'm just going to go do this and this is keeping me sober now. Cause it's not that, 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 that type of thing, you know, and that, that's, I think the point that we kind of circled <laughs> like back said, to. This would get me high yeah, in a minute. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I mean, that's, that, I always tell people, you know, cause they're like, I want to go tell my friend all about this, the, the program and this and that. And he needs it. And I'm like, he'll get you high before you get him clean. Yeah. <laughs> it's just generally the the rule of thumb there but and it's definitely true yeah so you know man thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it we're already me. at about an hour man almost oh, wow. yeah it goes it goes it does, quick it goes quick it goes really it was quick. really fun man i wish you know we could have touched on some other stuff well we will Whatever, we cool, will man. we'll get you back we'll yeah, get you back uh time. you know um and and i like i said I'm, I'm this is just the first a lot of my guests right now man this is just the first run through uh, I want to get Charlie back here. I got other people I want to get back here. There's a whole bunch of people I want to have on a, a few more times because I don't think we've even covered. With an hour, you can't sum up all, no. all of this. No. You just can't. <laughs> um, you know, and, and like I said, it's, you know, you tend to run, you know, sometimes we run a little long, sometimes we're a little short, but... You know, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, we get people back here to, to kind of cover whatever we didn't cover. Uh, because I think, you know, there's definitely more here to, to talk about. And you definitely talk about a whole bunch it, more stuff, man. And I, enjoy, to try to get you I enjoy follow. talking to you, man. Thanks, man. Is there anything you want to throw out there? Any plugs, any Facebooks, Instagrams, anything like that you want to put nah, out there? I'm You're not good? a plug guy. I'm good. Yeah, All right, good. man. No plugs for you then. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thank and you. And it's definitely been awesome having you on. And, and I definitely Bruce Buffer. You get a Bruce Buffer closer? Uh, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a Bruce, Bruce Buffer closer. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one we're going to need here. That. Hey. It's time. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks, Mark, again for coming on. Uh, this is ExtremeLife.com, Extreme Life Podcast. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Liberated Syndication, Spotify, all the Fies, any of them, uh, all the Facebooks and on the interwebs, we're, we're everywhere. Um, so uh, you can also go on the website, extremelife.com, to pull up any, uh, any podcasts or get any information. 
Um, so please stay tuned, tune in, and uh, subscribe everywhere. YouTube, uh, we're on YouTube. All the video uh, stuff will be on YouTube. So, guys, check it out. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you, awesome Steve. Awesome having you, buddy. And uh, we'll see you next time.